welcome to the global space on marketing strategies for sustainable products in Rwanda. Um, our today's uh, presenter is Jonathan Misero from Rwanda. He is a master student in international business studies at the University of Applied Science in Kufstein and one of the one world scholarship holders of the Afro Asian Institute. Um, Jonathan uh, was born in Kigali, Rwanda, and grew up there too. He did his bachelor in business management at the Mount Kenya Univers University in Rwanda and Kenya. He started in 2016. In 2017, he also published an ebook called Success Lessons Learned from Modern Age Social Influencers and Entrepreneurs. And he completed his bachelor's in 2019. And then he came to Kufstein to study international business studies. Um, Jonathan is also a podcaster and an active content creator. So today's topic is dealing with um, marketing strategies for sustainable products in Rwanda. Rwanda is uh, one of the leading um, showcases for sustainable development in um, countries of the global south. And yeah, since um, 2005, for example, national environmental agencies were established and um, the country is supporting waste management, sustainable energy supply, environmentally supportive architecture and ecotourism, among other things. So Rwanda is really um, developing also to a knowledge-based service provider and thus I think also, um, yeah, the country is a super example for a topic um, like today. And so I will give over the word to Jonathan now. Okay, thank you for introducing me. Uh, I have made a small presentation. We can walk through um, the different layers and steps which has been undertaken since this stage and what prompted those policies or that vision in general in order to reach the conclusion that uh, development can only be reached during and only when it is sustainable. So sharing with you my uh, not quite a lengthy presentation. I have many who talk about the uh, beginning of sustainable growth, the targeted audience, uh, the gender question, policies in place. And finally, we talk about the criticism of the policies and even the information in, in general. To begin, I would try to add on what has been said in the presentation. Rwanda is a land country in the Great Lakes region, a mostly situated in East Africa geographically and culturally, but also used to be in what can we be called as the Latin Africa sphere since it has been an English, a, a, a French speaking country since at least the Belgian colonization. So, but if we're talking about geographically and um, culturally, it is in the East African sphere. So, 13 million capital city is Chigari. It has the highest population density on continental Africa, meaning the land mass Africa, because outside there is uh, islands such as uh, Bartimica, I think, and we, which have elevated population density. Um, in, in spite of its small size, it also has diverse ecosystem. Uh, the western part is made of Congolian forest, uh, and also it has like a small uh, a part of land 
in the upper northwest of the country, which are the mountain mostly volcanoes. So there is a mountainous forest and ecosystem. Um, also, there is a, a, tro a tropical savanna in the eastern part of the country. So all these are mostly divided by known as a great Kongonir. It is a chain of mountain which divides the two ecosystems in. Uh, and that's where most of the conservation has been. Uh, coming from is the mostly preservation of all those ecosystems, but also without harming the population who used to be sustained or use the, those mountains, forests, and other for their daily needs. Um, the need for sustainability was mostly a political choice, but also a long time a ecosystem and development exercise. So firstly, the agriculture sector make up of 25% of national GDP. But during the time it started, it used to make much more than that. And during that time, it employed almost 90% of the population. And during that time, in 90s, early 2000, there was a desertification of the Eastern lands. It was mostly due to um, human activities which cut down the everything in its path, including forests, settling in marshland and everything, but also the use of non and other things. That what I may call human catastrophe was caused mostly by insecurities and mostly the genocide against trees, which uh, in its aftermath, bringing new diasporas, but also returning people. And so there was like a huge mass of people who needed land. So they sorted almost everywhere in parks, in natural reserves and everything. So they needed to be a policy, a sustainable, a, a comprehensive policy in order to protect everything on, on territory, but also to provide for those daily human. Uh, the second one was terrain. Rwanda is very hilly. Mostly like 60% of territory is hilly mountains. Only the eastern part is where maybe we can see a little bit of flat lands. So due, due to those terrain, there was mostly landside and others so if you cut the forest on the on the hills it means that you may have a problem in the future which means there will be landslide there will be erosion there will be any any sort of a human disaster that could be that place that happened uh the third was mostly to endangered species present on the territory. Rwanda is home to several endangered species, such as mountain gorillas, who by far that time they were foreign, uh, maybe they were like 500 times. It was like really on the brink of extinction. Also, there was golden monkeys and different type of birds. So a lot of things were um, running into the red zone of minerals. The second one was also the third one, I may add, is that also the country mostly is depend, at least some of the areas depend mostly on tourism and hospitality sector. So uh, if there was any sort of for or the continued degradation of those 
land, it will be a problem, but also not only an ecological one, but also an economic one. So there was a set of objective to reach, uh, to reach also to measure the, the impact of those policies. So those objectives were mostly poverty reduction, um, health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water, clean energy, economic growth, infrastructure, uh, reducing inequalities, green cities, responsible consumption, climate action, and protection of both life on land and below water, peace and justice, but also to foster bond with partners who may help or who may either uh, ideologically or uh, economically. The target of the DS, first and foremost, those who needed to understand that agenda was people who were living in those areas themselves, so wonders in general. And they needed to understand the benefit, the goals, because those things were radical, were radical. Uh, for example, it is hard to tell someone who is impoverished that you would need to cut the forest, his principal source of energy, in order to protect, say, the endangered species, so it is the human need pyramid, those kind of things lack, lack down, so it's not that high up. It went to an extensive media campaign and other persuasion efforts, but also to teach them that if that policy and agenda were successful, it would not only be in, uh, for the good of the country or the good of the environment, but also there were some economical gains to be had after the, the goals has been reached. So the, the principal goal of the agenda was poverty reduction as in 2009. Three in five people lived under poverty levels, so they had chronic hunger or agriculture was underfunded, so it was like every metric, well-being metric. So the, we can see here the number at the level of sustainable policy development. There is historical infant mortality rate that's at like ten percent. <laughs> Here it is one hundred and eleven kids per thousand children died before reaching the that's like ten percent. One in every ten kids could die before reaching the age of the five. So the literature also low sixty four sixty five almost. Poverty level were almost 60, so almost three in five people were living in the, the land of poverty. So it, it was really disastrous numbers and the government needed um, an idea, an agenda, a policy to tackle all those problems. Uh, other pressing issue was the gender equality. So first it was a demographic problem because at the, after the, the end of all insecurity problems, that means early 2000, that means that mostly the country was populated by women. I mean, 70% of population were women. So in order to implement any program, you needed 
a massive support, but also a massive participation of, of females and the program needed to be gender centered. So during those early days, it was not a, what I could say, it, it was a feminist agenda, but it was more of a demographic and an economic agenda, first and foremost. But after the country who have uh, recuperated, uh, maybe this could transform from a, a pragmatic uh, solution to simply uh, having a human question. So, but during those early days, it was mostly definitely a demographic question. So the, there was major changes which were made. There were parliamentary gender quotas. Thirty percent of all seats were mandatory to be filled with women. Uh, promotion of gay education. They have like the highest school dropout rate, highest interest rate, highest everything. So they need to be uh, in acute emphasis on the promotion of gay education, but also. It increased the woman participation in historical male dominated roles. So, uh, when you have like 70% of the whole country which are women, mean that nothing can be done without them, most definitely, from banking sector to transportation to everything which dominated before that time. Um, we are most definitely. Need, uh, needed to be more women in order to, for the country to function at best. So those ones were introduced in early 2000, and which made like the Rwanda cases quite like the early one I have ever seen. Uh, most people in 2000 and talking about some women issue, like the conversation which were, uh, we, are, we are being carried out in Rwanda. So. It was like an existential problems uh, inside the country. Second, they needed to be a sound economic growth. So if you, you needed to staff um, every other role which was lacking in order to develop, but also to provide means in order to reach such uh, the high standard difference say, because that 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 policy uh, was very expensive in terms of financial means. So a sound economic growth policy needed to behave in order to finance all those uh, problems, you know, problems, but also agendas. So there was next. It, there was a leave no one behind policy. So there was, if we're going to do these things, we need to be sure that we include definitely everyone inside. So there was more, the government and independent committees of civil society uh, pick out four different categories which needed special care, if I may say. So there was women who have been, for a historical reason, been left behind or marginalized by the society. But also it was a specific question. If you have more women, you need to be sure to include them more than anything else. There was also people with disabilities, like any, countries coming for more, like they have to be a, a huge number of people with disabilities, either physical, psychological. So the program also needed to address this question. Uh, so uh, people with disabilities had to be present every in every way, uh, in every strata of decision making policy. So that means they need to be like their special in the parliament, but also 
have their special organization and everything else. There was also youth. During that, that time, the huge majority was young people, mostly very young. And the program needed to be started, meaning that everyone, uh, it must be long term in order to not come back behind after a few years and say, oh, we made a mistake. So it needed to be used in long term thinking. Mm, but also they were, what you can call the indigenous people, which they, I don't know, they no longer use the words, but uh, uh, to, to, for understanding, it affects the people. There has been a, an ex, a big number of them, and people needed to be included because they were also dispossessed, but also negligated by everything, by the government, but also by the society at large. The next also was that they had like a marginalization issue. So there was those taboos, those sort of problem which many people could not sit with them, could something like that, something which was more mostly due to press this nothing. So uh, due to those questions, they needed to be special care to those people, but also to be included in mostly into the day-to-day -day life of the country. You see most of them lived in isolated areas, be it forest, be it somewhere where they were mostly alone. I mean, that uh, they were mostly all the program, all the innovation or other things which were started out were no, could not reach them or could not reach them at the given time. So they have these uh, years to catch up to everybody and they needed to be like a special program and a special care for them. But also due to the fact that if you are principal habitat is forest and they are being destroyed, it means that you are in danger too. So they needed to be like a special policy for the settlement, for education and everything else. Uh, the first thing which were introduced was the grid fund. The grid fund because put in place by the government. Uh, so in order to have the a grassroots movement, they, they need to be like, uh, made brands which were mostly focused on things which can be which don't need any technical knowledge in order to be uh, had uh, first and foremost there was construction there was a need for uh, a, a lot of uh, settlements so the returning diaspora and the returning refugee, everyone needed a place to settle. And it was only right that most of those follow a certain type of long term thinking. So there was, uh, Infound was there to, in order to assist the locally made solutions such as companies uh, and uh, others which could be used as a launching platform in order in order to to kickstart the 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 homegrown solution. So there was mostly construction. There is like they have been bricks made big uh, plastic or other non the degradable materials. They have been fashion, which mean like shoes, clothes, everything else, but also food industry. So it was mostly the most affected by the 
the past because if a country mostly live on uh, agriculture industry and it, the most pressing issue is the the complete the complete destruction of the ecosystem it will be a uh, in, in order to grow food, you will need some extra solution. But also there was energy. The, the problem which we are mostly depressing one was the forest as a source of energy. So people were going to forest looking for firewood, for a construction material, any type of energy or related issue was like, uh, seventy-five percent dissolved by going to the forest and cut down some trees. So this was leading to a fast a ecological deterioration, but also the the desertification of the place, which which is kind of really given that the the country is like one of the most. Uh, rain intensive area in the world so there was also a transportation issue but those one were started and those one were started for mostly long-term thinking because at the time there was a lack of found lack of technical know-how uh, but also lack of infrastructure in order to have this sort of green energy revolution so this was, was like a 2005, 2006, so it was still very old, but those ideas were there, but it was mostly um, started for some thinking because at the time, no one was thinking about, was taking the green transportation issue seriously. Um, so the marketing strategy, they, in order to, to make sure that the, the set in place brands and other ecological and sustainable brands hold on for a long term is that they need population. The local population must be and willing to purchase, but also put them before any cheaply exported uh, commodities elsewhere. So let's say, for example, there is the at the beginning they were start. You can see here is like Kuzuri K and Y. They made in they make their product in mostly non degradable materials such as um, waste tiles, uh, um, plastics, and other thing which cannot be disposed of easily. So, but the problem with any startup activity is that it is mostly very expensive in comparison to that can produce um, mostly in bulk, which means they can offer some cost reduction program or elsewhere. So there needed to be a marketing strategy, but also a governmental uh, strategy, which was mostly protective, but to make sure that those brands which were being set could also be, uh, could have a, a long-term uh, longevity, like everything else. So this strategy was the inclusion of a, a tax, a, a tax, which meant that it was something which were where, where you have the ability to produce something which is ecological, but it is either not cost effective or any other personal reasons or economical reason, which why would what want to produce ecologically, they need to be like a small tax in order to push the manufacturing sector toward uh, 
better means ecological sustainable means of, of production. The second one was also the marketing the marketing campaign. So uh, government went out of its way in order to promote the the importance, the benefits of uh, acquiring those homemade materials, which are very, uh, which at the time were mostly more expensive than other alternatives, in order to convince people mostly on why they should buy those kind of things. So they think they, they were made in Rwanda brand. So uh, you can see it here. And that is like, um, it's like a, a sign which we are given to everything which was produced ecologically, but also inside the territory. So it was a prey on the um, national, national reputation or in order to boost those, those brands so that they may have um, a, a clientele because they have to start especially if you're offering those kind of products. But also the, the government also did some hard uh, advertising, such as uh, providing um, digital platform to them, or even any, any sort of uh, informational gathering uh, materials in order to uh, to reach the most people about the the product in general. So there was also starting in 2015. There was also a a campaign which uh, during that time there was uh, there have been a momentum in, in internal market. So the government took a way initiated an international marketing campaign in order to increase um, the visibility of wonder made brands, but also its brand in order to, um, to bring in more awareness, but also physical means uh, such as finance, uh, technical, the recruitment of people where uh, in order most it was started for the conservation effort. So the, the conservation effort, which is closely related to the tourism sector, have been growing in the past years. So they needed to build on the momentum in order to bring national notoriety so that those conservation efforts can also uh, get their own, uh, have the, the ability to attract talent, first of all, second of all, uh, financial means. So that means that more people are willing to go out and visit those conservation efforts. And thirdly, the recognition of international recognition is also good, but also to improve with the image of Rwanda, which was mostly most people either were uh, completely black on Rwanda, so it's uh, not that very much known, uh, or had like a negative image of the country as a well whole due to historical reasons. So the, the campaign was mostly to, to reach those particularly three goals. Uh, the campaign was mostly done with, in cooperation with European and sometimes uh, uh, North, North American sports uh, clubs, but also other sort of uh, anywhere they can find. Uh, I have seen somewhere also Future in 
uh, national geographic channels uh, and other sort of natural and disc discovery and conservation networks so it was mostly aimed in order to bring in more people who are interested but also to to have a new culture as a whole so uh, starting in 2015 there was a planning for the future as whole uh, there was also that year that the Paris Climate Accord was signed. So the green and ecological sustainability issues were more bold, more ambitious uh, than the past maybe 10 to the last 15 years because the program started in early 2000. So there has been a vision 30 and the vision 20, all of which have different kind of um, uh, like step stones in order to lead a fully uh, ecological, sustainable economy, but also country. So uh, starting in 2015, they have been more and more broad and ambitious. Um, First of all, green mobility. So it was mostly done on two fold. The first fold was uh, automobiles in the sector. There was this uh, the setting of new plants, but also such as the Volkswagen one, but also like another one from Ghana, if I think, which was also approach to the say what the a lot of manufacturing car manufacturing uh, farms were approached in order to develop a, a a green mobility solution in autos. The second one was mostly done to for motorcycles. So the um Motorcycles are like a big transportation means, but also the cheapest one, the quickest one, the easiest one. Um, it is a Rwanda kind of Uber kind, but it's done with motorcycles because it's very fast because they, it can jump through congestions and other stuff, so which where the uh, Autos cannot do. So the government also targeted uh, that area. So there was a, a farm which was introduced, I think, 17, which is called HSEA, which is possible uh, to the production of e green mobility motorcycles. So in the thing the government has given to 2025 in order to have that all uh, motorcycle circulation to be green by that now, electric. The question you can add it on the, on the chat room so that you don't forget it or that I will pass to them later when uh, uh, it is the question then. P and A. Uh, so continuing, uh, we are talking about future and beyond. So we are talking about 2025 uh, projects or visions, which I called uh, Vision 20. There was um, Vision 20, 2020, which was the one implemented during the 2000s, then there will be vision 2030, then vision 2015. So, for, uh, for vision 2030, we have been seeing a lot of program which, uh, project which are uh, started. Uh, the thing now, given that some of the early problems have been 
answered a thing wrong, the government will attack itself to more developed um, quest, I think. So the the first phases was for mostly reducing hunger, reducing literacy, uh, the promotion of gender equality, all those things which were deemed very important at the time, but now people can have the means and the capabilities to dream big if uh, I use the words in order uh, to continue into that future. So for now, it seems that the project are becoming more long term, more uh, ambitious, such as the cities. For now, there is two great cities, with green cities which are started one in, um, it was almost in Kigali, almost on the outskirts of Kigali, while the other one is uh, slated to be almost like a resort, but to be mostly based around the Volcano National Park. So, about the green city it will take mostly five billion dollars uh, it is like the first project which i think is like a test subject to see if those a kind of standards are really compatible with the african or in particular Rwandan way of culturally economically or if so it, they are in the testing stage. So, um, so far, the news that we got about the green city is that they will be hundred percent autonomous from the national grid, from the, which means they will be mostly than on solar power. They will be green mobility. Every car, every uh, sort of mobility solution will be electric. They will be cheap, yeah, but affordable apartment for those who can. Those who can't afford uh, very high priced settlement. There will be also some areas of uh, uh, for middle class and upper middle class, but also I think uh, yeah, middle class and upper middle class uh, status people. But also classes, malls, and everything. See how this thing it could work in and make change if it kind of um, doesn't work much. So first, it is meant on cohabitation. So uh, during two thousand and ten, the government planned like a. Uh, Urban master plan program exercise, which was, which still is an exercise of, of this coexistence between classes of people without having any friction among amongst them. So there is this idea of trying to fight the uh, slums and everything else. But also that the society doesn't become too alienated or too divided. Like uh, whatever those projects have been mostly tried, they seem to be started for high earning people. So the country itself doesn't have that much of high earning people or high earning demographics. So they needed to be that those green cities are affordable to the vast majority, which will be, by the way, young people who are mostly under 25, like 60%, 65% of the population is under 25. So the country need to be able to provide ecological um, settlements, cheap price but also in the most possible ways so 
uh, those are the first project. Uh, if they prove to be successful, um, the model will be replicated in the country, mostly starting in urban centers. So the master plan, the urban master plan said that the, the only big capital Chigari is the one around not reach it will only reach four million. So anything many the planners have estimated that it will cause maybe unavoidable conditions to congest uh, congestion and other things. So they want have spread out cities, but also where people living in inside those same cities can have greenery, parks, and everything else without having having to move that far from home. So if you look at the picture, you see that Chigar is like very green. Even inside the roads, there is planted trees and grasses. So people usually don't like to live in very concrete dominated structures. So Adding that to an African context and take even more place in, inside people's heart as they see an environment where it's building as some sort of prison. So they have been, for example, um, an idea of that maybe high as this, they could only occupy one place in general, so no other places. Uh, that everything else cannot be above four stores building. So that's the kind of city mostly um, people want to live in. But also due to the fact that urban settlement as we know it today, and like a typically new colonial uh, inventions. Before, people used to live also in the city, but they were less conditioned than that. Uh, there were many settlements, but most never exceeded 50, 50,000 people. So people are still very much attached to that idea of having unguarded or at least in the walking distance park, something like that. So that's, that's why there was like in every 2000, there was also introduction of a very cheap uh, high-rise apartment blocks, but many people didn't like the idea that this fact that it functioned well in Nairobi, the government wanted to import that the solution here, yeah, but it proved to be unpopular. So everything else is started along the line of satisfying the 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 needs of the population. So also the there was another idea of a green airport, a hundred percent green airport. So uh, the only example I can find of is in Singapore. It's the only one, but maybe one in China too. But everywhere uh, airport has been has been proven to be polluting most. Of. So as we speak, there is construction of a new uh, airport, which will be 100% ecological, and which will also try to balance uh, the need for transportation and the need of uh, ecological and sustainability agenda. Uh, tourism and natural natural conservation. So they have been a sweated a policy, a, a invigorated policy of conservation, um, but also of revitalizing some spaces which were depleted. So in the east, there is a Kadira National Park. So before the insecurity and the settlement of people inside that particular 
it used to be a very very savannah dominated place but with population growth insecurity and other uh, problems the the animals were completely gone so there has been this policy of um, adding the introducing uh, some species such as lion elephant tigers which were completely uh, i think hunted down or just neglected this way because uh, they were, have been getting this space but also natural reserves and other stuff um, such as the the, the mountain uh, the golden markies i uh, used to be i think i still on the list of um, endangered species i haven't checked where so there has yes uh, of the park in area which are known to be inhabitants so that that area can be protected too uh, but conservation we must say in most cases we forget that those new areas which are being reclaimed by the government um, in order to to introduce or protect the parks are mostly used by, by the local population of the or at least the locality of that area so in order to have successful conservation efforts but that must be people centered so uh, there has been a program which in uh, invoke that uh, the parks must share at least 20 percent of their uh, uh of their profit to communities areas so that means the, the construction of schools the providing jobs for people around that area so that because those same people used to be fed and they, their houses used to be the energy source was the forest. So anything else which goes or doesn't, the uh, human needs need to be, we definitely not succeed because uh, poaching is like a job. If people aren't getting any kind of substitute, uh, substitution job, they will return to that one, which will be kind of harmful to the conservation efforts. Uh, so, uh, to finish off, there have been criticism of the policies and other methods used uh, in order to, to reach this particular essence. For example, the first one is like a top down structure, which means that this whole thing uh, has been uh, engineered, financed, uh, put in place by one single body, the government and its associated boards and branches. So, international, uh, international NGOs, or even some people inside the country say that it will have proven to be maybe way easier to to include uh, people in the formulation of those uh, in the tough process of the of those policies. But also there is an idea that the the projects are too far ambitious. Uh, for a country with a population such as high density population, because uh, currently we have the country have increased its uh, its natural 
forest came it from 10% in 2006. By now, the forest coverage is at 30%. So that's like an increase in 20% in the past. In only like decades, I think. So it has been heavy crystals that they also, which may bring that the disturbance the policy making may have sometimes crash with the population interest. Uh, the other one is that uh, resources could be spent elsewhere, that maybe those green cities or whatever effort the campaign slogans and other resources spent on it could be used uh, for something else, but I, I think uh, could be used maybe, uh, I don't know, could be used somewhere else. The, the other one is the heavy interference in private matters in, in public markets. So uh, first and foremost, we have talked about how the government single-handedly made those uh, sustainable brands, the, the top selling brands anywhere because they were behind them. Those new local made solution were mostly put forward by the government itself. So main, some econom uh, economists uh, criticize the thing, uh, the policies for the Keynesian economists, uh, which is in University of Rwanda have been saying that maybe every interference is bad, so that everything should not be um, put a, should not be government centered that much. Sometimes just let the market do their job. Uh, final conclusion. And, uh, been done uh, to promote uh, economies, mm, economy, uh, sustainable economies, both physical and intangible. Uh, the, still, uh, the route is still wrong to reach the 2015 goals, but so far the trend have been successful. Even I may say that they are avant-garde, uh, visionary, because in 2000, when the government introduced most of those, most people were people, uh, even people from outside the international community was was mostly skeptical if those is the that way to take. But as we have seen during this past ten years, we have seen that uh, it was the right choice to make, given the climate change and the uh, social and economic inequalities which are gripping the world. That this kind of uh, heavy government involvement were kind of necessary to lift many people out of poverty. Even if now the poverty level has been steadily decreasing, many people still need to be that. Um, the poverty levels have been reduced from 60% in 2002 to reach now almost 21%, so that's like the number of poor people have been cut in half. So the program seem working. So by 2030, I think, in the hope that those uh, programs yield much effect that we don't have those kind of uh, problems such as a uh, poverty or anything else. Uh, uh, so this is the journey I have to, 
to summarize the journey from its beginning in 2000, which was the introduction of Vision 2020. In 2006, there was the first step in banning um, degradable objects. Uh, 2008 was the election of the gender balance parliament of government. I think at the time it was 50-50, 50 male, 50 female. 2010, there was the review of Millennium Development. The Millennium Development Goals uh, are the UN chartered goals in order to review on how the world is doing on certain issues such as gender, poverty, hunger, and everything else. 2014 was the introduction of Green Energy Goals, but that everything else was just typically ecological friendly goals. Uh, 2015, it was the start of sustainable development goal, SDGs, which was signed. Um, but also the, the, the last review of the Millennium Development Goal. So I have said the numbers have been quite encouraging reduction of infant mortality, reduction of gay dropout numbers, reduction of gender disparities in outcomes. So everything has been growing pretty much. Um, about oh, I don't know, five million, five million people. I don't remember what the numbers. But one in four people have been left out of poverty and one million alone starting from 2016 to 2019. So everything going well. Um, yet to see the impact of the coronavirus because before that, the country was growing with a steady 10% growth. And by that, those numbers, many people were uh, trying to see that by maybe 2015, we may have reached uh, middle class status. No, 2030 and 2050, maybe the, the developed country status, but it's hard now to assess the long term impact of the coronavirus because. Uh, I think 2020, uh, the, the economy was, there was like a ratio of 3.5% growth, which was way down than the projected, maybe 10.9% growth, which was expected. This year, they will be like, 5.6% recovery. So in maybe 2022, uh, we can return to the pre COVID numbers of two, two. Uh, no, but uh, it's, it is still fresh. Uh, the vaccination process is going slowly. They're trying to set up uh, a, a vaccination plant here, but um, going by the speed, maybe they can. Uh, the production of those may take like a year, something like that. And, uh, everything here is, is kind of uh, still phasing, but yeah. Uh, but the numbers, uh, two-digit growth may be returning or maybe nine or eight, eight percent or nine percent, which are definitely good, may be returning next year. Uh, thank you. And if anyone has questions, he can ask. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your great presentation. Really very um, insightful, I would say. Um, 
Yeah, I have prepared some questions, <laughs> but if anybody has else questions, please feel free to ask. Um, yeah, one of the questions I wanted to pose is um, if this um, sustainable growth uh, policies were also influenced somehow by external countries, or is it really something that is uh, Rwanda grown? Uh, so in 1999, there was a set, a, a set up of a committee which went around the or the I think in the Asia and in the Pacific to assess what they were doing right, who were failing to do. So the the committee went into China, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, definitely even South Korea. So the Asian Tigers uh, in test what could be uh, done in order to alleviate problems back home. So I can say that, yeah, many people can see a, a much influence of Singapore for maybe a the orderness, the cleanness, sort of like thing. Although I can say that it's kind of a culture thing for the to want to organize this thing. But also the the city planning efforts were mostly by inspired by Singapore. Then also the economical on economical and manufacturing sector it is mostly influenced by um, during the Deng Xiaoping era policies mm -hmm. for example the setting up of uh, special economic development zone where the in order to increase the so there was a problem of the lack of infrastructure mostly electricity and roads and other trade logistics, which start for the, the creation of a dynamic uh, manufacturing in a sector. So they come up with this uh, idea that you can maybe concentrate those uh, manufacturing farms in one area and in order to make sure that the little infrastructure that is there well, which can be allowed to be saved can reach those areas so that we, we can kickstart uh, the the manufacturing sector but it was mostly influenced by chinese guangzhou and uh, other other cities uh, Um, because you, you you are talking also about energy supply, where uh, is the ecological energy supply coming from? Um, because yeah, it's not so easy to to get uh, <laughs> sustainable and yeah eco friendly energy. Uh, so the there is maybe two two sort of um, uh, solutions which have been very Firstly, there is um, a hydroelectric. The second one is atomic. We have been in partnership with uh, Russia, a company which called Rostov. I, I don't remember where we need to check. Build a, a, a nuclear plant, but there have been a lot of arguments in the parliament if really if nuclear is really ecological because they, they need to be disposable waste, and many people are saying that maybe we should not sacrifice um, our own. Have in order to reach 
some sort of material well-being system that we can work on our soda or there is even methane gas which is being extracted right now uh, but most people are sure that we can't really keep that a very a, a very impressive manufacturing but the the next option. so the the, the what the, the, the nuclear option uh nuclear uh, energy so the there is, the, is what um the, the, also, uh, sorry they are up to use the nuclear energy i didn't understand it okay so there is like a Argument if that the country cannot launch the manufacturing sector without uh, heavy nuclear influence, that it is the cheapest because uh, we still have we still have like the maybe the costliest uh, energy the electricity in East Africa, I think. Kenya comes first, we are second. So maybe people are saying we can do that in the given time, which is 2030, they need to present the, the, final, uh, so the, the final, uh the final, how can I say it, the result mm -hmm. in, in that Decision. the government mm -hmm. said uh, what the, the objective and after that years they need to present before the population say that during this time we did that we did that so that uh, during the vision 2030 there is that the, the our manufacturing sector need to be more dynamic so that has been the 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 argument but as of options there is methane gas there is uh, sora which have been also included mm -hmm. uh, and the usual hydroelectric mm -hmm. option um, so the nuclear one is the one who, which is the causes controversy but other ones are pretty much fine but are there already nuclear powers um, in Rwanda, uh, there is a, they have been signed something to construct. Uh, let me check the idea. I think by in three years, the project needs to be completed. So, uh, even past the parliament, so the nuclear deal is on the table now, I think. Mm, okay, but in it's three, not running yet, no? Yeah, in three years, yes. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have questions? Um. Unless I wanted also to ask you, uh, what is the diaspora who, who is coming to Rwanda, especially? The uh, people? The diaspora, which kind of it? We have had like a many diaspora migration patterns. Which one in particular? Um, I mean, the ones that you talked about, in your presentation okay so in uh, there was ethnic uh, motivated programs so they just mostly to this out of the country so the returning diaspora was talking about is those people who returned they were like maybe one million of them they returned mostly in 1995 to 1997 but also they were refugees who went outside the country in 1994. 
so they came back also in 
matching that with settlement materials we could expect with us providing um, an inclusive maybe staircase or stairway uh, so everything are good by now but i think the movement more now is much its first days it was focused on mostly the the physical kind of disability so during it was like people who were missing limbs and can, that kind of stuff but this new generation are more focused on uh, psychological so they have been recently a bit talk on the mental health issues the uh, drug abuse, all kinds of things, but I think there is, they have been included, so they have like a permanent seat in the, uh, in the parliament, and they have like their own commission, which is uh, adjacent to the government, so they can voice their concern, but there is always uh, integration issue, the old ones, which uh, a more Mm, physical mm, conducive environment for physically in the, in disabled people in the new ones. But I think they are coming around to understand each other. I think they, and they, the problem which is more most basic generation issues. But what we have reached those, they did, uh, there is a collective support for everyone. So you have the feeling that the society is, society is really um, trying to live together and support each other. Yeah, I think most people are convinced that in order not to repeat it, that any group must not be marginalized or feel like they live outside the society. So uh, many people are really receptive when they say that a certain Mm -hmm. uh problem isn't or a certain environment isn't very conducive to you so the, the memories of conflict here that this place people who are in power position have been active participants in those during those years so there is this uh, inclusion climate which is there so that's going to repeat history but yeah and is it also for children who are born with disabilities that they are supported in kindergarten or schools and so on? Yeah, there is mostly, um, they are all, there is for severe disabled people who can run maybe for the place of other non-disabled kids. So those who are not fit at their own educational curriculum, they are school are called HVPs, which they run uh, according to their own pace, but also to their own physical and emotional, psychological well-being and others. But there is also where the disability can't uh, hinder you from learning with others, so that's where they also need to go to school with the others, so mm -hmm. there's two of them. Great. Mm. Um, yeah, I was wondering also about the transportation solution, the ecological ones, uh, that they are mostly um, um, e solutions like e cars or e motorbikes. But where are these? cars and motorbikes then produced? Uh, so there is one uh, auto, auto, auto manufacturing, I think it's Volkswagen, it has like a, a subsidiary here which produces mostly e cars. Oh, okay. so, but their output has been maybe low, but uh, it is started by 2025 or two. Um, and they will have done enough in order to support the uh, the local auto demand. So there is also motorcycles. 
those were produced in high numbers. Um, for that, I think in maybe five years, they will be enough in order to be, uh, to be completely electric. Mm -hmm. And they are also produced in Rwanda? Yeah, they are produced in Rwanda. And what are the public means of transportation that are mostly used? Uh, bus transportation, there is like three, five companies. So this one is mostly dependent on the government. So we don't know typically how to go if they will change, but mostly if the public changes, I think they will, they will change before that, yeah. And it's mostly buses. Three buses. Mm -hmm. They could have a problem if they, there is a construction of a standard gold railway. I don't know if there is or something, but maybe it's electric mostly. Mm -hmm. Another question is because we are about talking about transportation is about the green airports because airplanes themselves aren't really green. So what? So the the construction of like the architecture of the airport will be ecological hundred percently, but the flights themselves they really can't be hundred percently, I suppose. And how do they want to regulate this? um dependencies uh i think in the world there is like two major uh, manufacturers of airplanes uh, airbus and boeing so on that on that area i don't think they can do much i think from there if american want it <laughs> and the technology is there in the past they can change that but uh, unless you want to cut yourself from the rest of the world, you need to use airplanes. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the big problem with that. I don't think there is much that the government can do about that. Yeah, interesting because uh, I also had a presentation on Costa Rica and its um, ecological food steps and so on. And they are like trying to, to uh, balance it through, yeah, making the High at a country more CO2 um, friendly and also by growing more forests so that um, producing more um, yeah um, how oxygen um, can balance <laughs> the CO2 uh, output. So this might be a way how how it's like planned. I can imagine like uh, uh, increasing forest cover. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think, yeah, we were at 30 percent. Some people want to reach at uh, 50 percent, but that would need proportional to the increasing of urban space. So, if people are willing to move into the cities, which will not happen under this, uh, our parents' generation are not that enthusiastic about cities and everything, but maybe ask who can do it, I don't know. But other than that, 30% seems like a good number. It will, it will be up to the current generation to, to decide what kind of cover they want. Mm. Okay, um, I will look up if I have one more question. Mm. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, I missed the early part of your presentation, but I wanted to know if still uh, Rwanda is big on using technology, uh, especially in the health sector. Um, like I saw once, they were using drones to um, uh, transport blood to hospitals. which are in is it still uh, being done by the government and is the government still using technology to improve like the health sector in, in Rwanda? Uh, okay, thank you. But mostly I think the government's use of technology is mostly twofold. 
uh, first is uh, technological leapfrogging. The other one is uh, the cost uh, the technology. For example, the adoption of a drone delivery was mostly was mostly adopted due to terrain. So the majority of the country's surface area is a hill terrain. So that means that going through mostly to reach like in any case of emergency, if you walk by car, you will take like a long time in order to decrease the uh, duration between and the point of supply of the healthcare facility, which includes the, the blood supply, the drug supply, and the other, which means that in any case of emergency, it will take time, and some people may die due to the traject trajectory of the in the terrain muscle. So drone bypass that by flying over the hilly terrain, which make it faster but also cheap because. Um, Later, they found that the the cost of moving from one place, the supply place to the place of need, it will be much more costly than maybe using a drone to supply all those areas together. And the second one is deep fog. So you don't need many drones to to do deliveries. Uh, I think that the zip line uses about um, 50 drones, but for the ambulances which were tasked before that, they, need, they were in 300 something, so they were still insufficient. There was a need for like a thousand, always circulating in order to to provide the needed materials in the short term possible. So also during this time, they are still big on using the technology in every... I have seen that also when I reached in, in Kigali Airport, they had the, uh, the, the robots were the ones which were conducting like the, uh, the coronavirus, like the the DV check or the, the rehearse status and other things. So they are still big on it, but also it is like uh, a limitation effect. So if you use too much technology, maybe kids will take on that culture and develop um, technology. You see like uh, the introduction of those drone ambulances have sprung up like a, an ecological drone manufacturing sector here, which was like a part of before 2016 when ZIPLINE came to the country. So they need to inspire those young people to also try to imitate those new technology which have brought up into the country and imitate it, learn from it, to also that to be self-sufficient in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one question about the water supply. Is it because you are, were also talking about um, how to um, keep the cities uncongested? Um, is it like this that the drink that this is drinking water? Um, or yeah, how is the water supply in in the main cities? The there is water supply plants uh, across the countries. Uh, there is like uh, uh, say before the thing, the last uh, census was done. In 2009, there was like uh, a problem with supply of water in the country. Only like uh, uh, 
19%. I hear you very hardly, Atom. Okay, 19% used to have like clean water. So the urbanization of the environment was also done in order to, in order that those uh, the water supply is way, is more uh, easy because if people live, everyone on one, here, another one there, it is always easy to effectively distribute and water su supply to those two. So the, the, the congestion issue was mostly maybe to the urbanization issue, if you say so, was mostly put forward so that people have easy access to those kind of like it jumped from 19 percent to now i think 80 percent so it has been working mm -hmm. okay so um one of my last question would be um uh if it is possible to, because you you talked also about the criticism and the, um, yeah, the state governed um, decisions that are not really real, uh, yeah, like realistic for the developments. Um, but is it possible to to communicate this criticism publicly, or is it hard? Um, they have been have been a lot of communication back and forth between the government of the people. It is easy, pretty much easy, because we have like a, uh, which way are in the graphic? Oh, now the connection is very bad. Uh, which is, which Oh, I don't Okay, hear. which is basically, which is basically uh, where you meet you with the uh, uh, administration, if you are like in a certain district, uh, once a year you meet with administration, you use the mayor, the and other kind of government officials, and they present to you the uh, what the policies or plans uh, the but also the results uh, how well, you also you voice you are in the disappointment or criticism or everything else or although those kind of things are mostly attended by other people other people I think mostly the use today are mostly voicing their concern on social media, Twitter mostly. So, so starting by 2018, it was, I left behind that. It is one dimension. It means other people talking to each other, later that talking to the whole country. Uh, every government and government bureaucratic and boards and are mandated to have a social media presence, but also even government officials themselves. So every once in a while we have like an ask, ask the president hashtag, I think it is uh, in October, ask the president and he answer every question for or oh, at least uh, yeah, every question on the Twitter feed and in, I think Instagram too and Facebook. Uh, then there is also the, uh, you can also voice your concern mostly, I think most people use it for uh, our police. So most people have been having problems with police during this lockdown. Day, so. uh, uh, yeah, it is easy, but uh, the problem is that looking from from outside within, it is less maybe 
seen because of the way or or effect because most of them are done in Kenya Rwanda so it is hard for like a foreigner to uh, to see that even such thing happened so it is mostly uh an internal thing so it is hard to tell someone from outside the uh, saying that yeah we do this we do that yeah they can't understand uh, maybe the language or others but yeah the government have been increasing um, and the responsibility and uh, accountability side of their uh, policies i think it has been also provided some uh, good efforts uh, since the last index the group of index we, we are uh, Rwanda has been moving like places i think they are like second in africa so it's has been good so um, the only criticism i may say is that to begin maybe to read before that it was an in kind of in kind of thing we mean like old people from it somewhere decide everything then one day you hear like yeah we're going to do this thing which was kind of a bit especially since like 60% 65% as youth so the many most young people were say like ah, those kind of literally I don't have the same ideas as my father he should not be deciding for me so but during those years they have been improving and I hope to get there by the day so yeah mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. so my last question would be um um, because I, I also saw that you were born, born not uh, far before 2000, um, the year 2000, and so you must have been growing up in this uh, great developing time of, of making Rwanda more sustainable. Um, how is it like for the whole population? Are there artists uh, sustainable? Uh, no, how shall I say? Do they have the sustainable consciousness? Do they really want to purchase products that are sustainable? Um, or yeah, and want to to improve to go the back. Hmm? Like to go back or. Not to go back, but maybe they are more interested to to gain capital, or I don't know, <laughs> or are they really up to to develop the country more sustainable? <laughs> uh, so it, it's kind of hard to to have a benchmark. Is everything before that was basically death, hunger. So most people are not nostalgic about anything that came. So. It is hard to say that like, if I had like something else to compare to a wood, but uh, before the implementation of the program, many it it is so slowly. Many people don't really, especially in the beginning. So telling people that you are burning people or matters in 2008 was like a big step. Everyone was like, what? What's the right that? But the problem is that most of things we are uh, maybe when you go outside of the country, you, you it's kind of hard to understand why would anyone uh, be pro or sustainable uh, policy. Since you know, it's kind of hard to see the impact mostly vividly uh, during that time. But in the which is being literally becoming a desert, it is easy to convince people. You say, if you don't do that, we may soon cease to exist. So maybe it is hard to under, and mostly that's the problem the government has been having with explaining to the international community. Mm about its steps on that thing and how people uh, can be so co 
this because uh, another ecological issue is was not existential you live your life without dumping thing everywhere so not really a problem but here it was like really an existential problem so nobody missed those times yes they may be critics may say who may be we doing too much the government doing too much but at the end of the day many they, they aren't really nostalgic for any pre or whatever is because it was really kind of a bad environment a bad history so most people are not really that faced with anything else Mm, yeah, I understand. But I just mean the habits like being sustainable to to uh, eat sustainable food and sustainable um, clothes, buy sustainable clothes and so on, um, try to have ecological energy. Okay. So everybody has this consciousness or is it like mm, depending on who or what is accessible? Uh, it's mostly a, a generation issue at the beginning. Younger people are more uh, knowledgeable on ecological issues, but other people, we are mostly due to the survival self-serving issues. That, uh, even now, I don't think they understand very well the existential problem of climate crisis. Just at that, that time, Uh, people were like, if we don't do that, we're going to become like this, that, that they could understand. But as people went more, went for being, right now, people are like, um, uh, it, it's kind of um, complicated. The other people, of course, there is no, let's say, for example, plastic uh, bags. Everyone hates them because they are kind of, they tend to to be a pollutant to the, not really to the environment, but also to the, everyone just throwing something on the street is generally, culturally seen as badly, so that's what they can understand. But in, for example, they can't, understand why we need um, the green mobility, why we need the electric, electric cars. So, uh, it depends on how much there is between the supplier and today. So you can tell them that the ozone will be destroyed uh, because he keep driving his old car. But they can understand that the plastic bags will damage their land. So that's what they can understand. Like ecological airport, ecological green cities, uh, they are like, okay, they don't seem to understand mostly. Uh, but younger people clearly understand, they have grown into that climate, so they know, uh, they know everything they need to know there, but other people, it's kind of a, a complicated issue. Anything they can't see firsthand. Hmm. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's really amazing what kind of knowledge you have and yeah, great presentation and great answers to questions.